So we're going to be starting a series on the book of Romans, and I mean, we're going to we're going to just you know allow the Lord to lead us and see where we go with it. Uh, not going to you know be so bound to it that if the Lord breaks in and wants to, and we'll just think you know give a specific message, then you know we'll uh, allow the Lord to speak in that sense. But for the most part, we're going to try to travel on Wednesday nights through the book of Romans and. Um, I'm excited about it. Praise God. The way, and, and, and it probably won't just be me teaching all of these uh, particular messages. Um, but when I when I do it, I'm going to try to go through the, the whole chapter, at least read the chapter, and then see where the Lord wants me to focus. Amen. So we're going to be in the King James Version, and we'll start in Romans chapter 1, and we'll start with verse 1. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the first seven verses, and then... And then we'll, um, we'll kind of go backwards and look at a couple of words that I wanted to point out. Father, I just give you glory and honor and thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than the two-edged sword. And it divides asunder, Lord. Joint from marrow and soul from spirit, Lord God. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, Lord. And you speak to us through your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts through your word, Lord, and that through this series, Lord God, you would help us to gain a deeper revelation and understanding of what you're communicating to the to the church specifically, what you would desire for the whole human race to know, what you would desire for those that are called by your name to proclaim, Lord, upon this fallen earth, Lord, that the opportunity might go forward for those that will be called by you to be saved, oh Lord God, and we just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and read. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So really, I'm just going to go ahead and stop there. But the, the first word that really that sticks out to me is, is actually verse one with the, the word related to the, to the word servant. Now, if you look in the New King James Version, it actually translated it translates it as slave. And I always really like that particular uh, translation of the word because that's what it means. It, the word is do loss and it means to be a slave. And it can even it can describe a slave either literally or figuratively. And then also this is interesting, either involuntarily or voluntarily, meaning a person in, in the Roman Empire, and even as many times as we've understood slavery to be in various nations, many times people are born into slavery. Right. And so in that particular case, they're actually born involuntarily. Now, interesting is this is this truth that whenever we're born again, whether we realize it or not, if we're truly born again, we're actually born into a willing form of slavery. This goes back. The Old Testament type is, is it has to do with the bond slave. Whenever the, the word of God was speaking of that, where a person was was able to sell himself in order to be able to pay off his debt, but he had to will willingly allow himself to be indentured as a servant or a slave, but then the time came whenever he was free to be released. But many times his master was good to him, so he, therefore he wouldn't want to be released, right? And that was whenever they would put the all their ear to the door and, and allow the all to go through. So they were but the point is is that they were a willing servant. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I am a willing servant of the Lord. I'm willing to be a slave of the of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that he was 
called to be an apostle. You know, the word apostle literally means to be a sent one. And, and the word also for ambassador is, is utilized to describe an apostle. And, you know, the way that Strong de defines it is that apostles following their ministry was also signs and, and miraculous signs and wonders. Amen. But he was separated into the gospel of God, which was aforementioned by the prophets. And so the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ was promised in the Old Testament through the prophets for ages concerning his, his son Jesus. And it says, according to the flesh, that Jesus was born of the son of David. So it's important that we understand that Jesus had an earthly heritage, amen? And that the scripture teaches that, see, and that's another thing, and many of you already know this, but that the prophets foretold that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah and that ultimately he would be of the seed of David. And so we see that he has an earthly heritage, but that he was declared to be the son of God by the power of the resurrection. And I think that that's important um, for us to, to understand that, that, that it, it's not the cross that declared him to be the son of God. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is this, is that all men are appointed to die. Amen. And so dying the death of the cross would made his death. I'm going to use the big word efficacious or what made his death effective was the fact that he was without sin. He was God born of man into the world in order. But because he had no sin, death had no right to hold him down. And so. He was declared to be the son of God because of the resurrection. And look at, look at that, how it says in verse four, uh, the spirit of holiness. That's how, that's how we know that he was the son of God because he resurrected from the dead. Amen. Because you see, the scripture teaches us that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He tells us that later on in the letter to the Roman church. But right now, he's, he's making the point that Jesus is proven. Number one, he's got an earthly heritage. We know he was the son of David because it says it. Luke, Luke's genealogy says it. Matthew's genealogy says it. He came, he came born of earthly descent. He was of the, the lineage of David. But he's proven to be the son of God because of his spirit of holiness, amen, that, that, that he resurrected from the dead. He alone is the one that's proven to be without sin. I, I found a note that I had put in my notes many years ago, and I used to say this quite a bit, that, you know what, there's two men that have walked the face of the earth, and that walked the face of the earth without sin, but there's only one that died that way. Adam was created in the image and likeness of God, Amen. Um, but Adam took sin upon himself and took sin within himself. Okay, but Jesus was born of God and he died without sin. And that's why he robbed the grave of its victory. Amen. And, and that's what the, the letter to the Corinthian church uh, tells us. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and go down a little bit further here. Um, he, he says in verse Eight, he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. He doesn't really explain explicitly what the gift that he wants that his desire is to impart and um, the word impart means to give or or to share over um, but he but he does explain at the end of the verse he says that you might be established and that same word for gift can be utilized to describe spiritual gifts um, and impartation has to do with the laying on of hands he did lay hands on Timothy whenever he talked about imparting the the, the gift that was given unto him through the laying on of hands um, 
and, it, and he's referring to it as a spiritual gift. But I have to be truthful if I stay true to the verse and it says that they might be established. To, to me, it seems to be speaking directly related to the gospel of Jesus Christ because he's talking about the gospel of God. He's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's saying that this particular spiritual gift that he desires to impart to them would be able to establish them. But this is one thing that I wanted you to see also moving into verse 12. He says this, that is that I may be comforted together with you uh, by the mutual faith of both you and me. And I think that this is really important for us to see here because the Apostle Paul is really, I don't think that you can find a more profound mover, if we can say it like this, a bigger mover and shaker in the kingdom of God that, that accomplished the things that were accomplished by a mere man under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you would get from the Apostle Paul. And he said, I want to come unto you because I have a desire to impart some spiritual gift to you. But no, no let me make that clear. Not, not just that I would impart it to you, but that you and I would be comforted together. Amen. And he's saying because we have a mutual faith, both of you and of me. And I think that it's important that we realize that, the, that to the Apostle Paul, the body of Christ was important. Yes. The body of Christ was important and he wants us to understand that the body of Christ should be important to you. Yes, yes. I know that the body of Christ is becoming more and more important to me. Amen. Amen. And so he's saying that, listen, this is going to comfort me. This is going to bring consolation to me to be with the people of God. And so I got to tell you that whenever I see you show up for church, it encourages me. Amen. And, Amen. and I hope that you're encouraged when you, when you show up for yes. church. Amen. Amen. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was let or restrained, it could be said, uh, hitherto. In other words, I was prevented that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And he says in verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and unto the unwise. You know, that word debtor is an interesting word. It means to owe someone and to be under obligation. Now, he said earlier that I'm a servant or a slave, and now he's saying I'm a debtor. I, I, owe, I owe a debt, right? And, 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 you know, I'll never forget uh, Brother Luke Pogue. Y'all may not remember. I don't know, but he preached two messages when we first started the church and one of the messages that he preached was he said I am dead and he was utilizing it like it was a title like it was a name like in other words I'm dead instead of him calling himself my name's Paul and I'm coming to see you I am dead I, I owe an obligation you know the scripture talks about for though I preach the gospel I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon yes, me yes. woe is me yes. if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ here's this man yes, yes. that was found on the road to Damascus going to get letters from the from the leadership in order to throw Christians into prison and to have their lives taken and there the light from heaven shines and knocks him down and <clears throat> And begins to speak to him. His life is transformed and he's never going to be the same. And I don't know about you, but I know some of you personally. And I know good and well the Lord done pulled you out of some mess. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. And probably more than once. Come on. If you're anything like me, he's pulled you out more than once, right? And, and what goodness. Amen. And listen, I just want you to know that, that, that we're debtor. We owe him. And listen, even if you're not called to preach the gospel, you've been called to the ministry of reconciliation. And what does that mean? God, God desires people to be reconciled to him. Mankind in his sin without Jesus is separated from him, right? right. But God wants, God wants to use us and, and we're indebted to him to be used by him in that way, right? Be, and that we're led by the Holy Spirit, amen? And that, and that he would be able to, to, to use us in that way. He says, so as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you <coughs> that are at Rome also. I like the way I like if you go back to verse 14, though, he says, he says, I, I owe an obligation to the Greeks and the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise, those that are smart, 
those that maybe aren't as smart. It, it's like, or those that are cultured and refined. Those that aren't cultured and refined, he's not making, he, he, you know, everybody's level at the foot of the cross. Amen. We're all level at the foot of the cross. Jesus, Jesus warned us about that kind of thing too. I just went in my notes, but just to say, we have a tendency to really favor people that look like they have money, right? We have a tendency, like they come in with long, you know, I mean, in, the old, in, in these times, long flowing robes and silken material and things of that nature. But you, you get my point. Like what we might would bypass someone that looked like they were maybe of average wealth or looked like maybe they were poor. And then we're wanting to move on to the, to the person that looks like they, like they have something. But that's not the way Jesus sees people. Amen. As a matter of fact, Jesus is kind of like the opposite of that. Like, in other words, if we're, if, if, if our mindset is that way, the Lord, the Lord's letting us know that he's got a problem with that. Okay. And so anyway, uh, praise God. The gospel is for everyone. Amen. So transitioning into verse 16, this is really where I would say we're getting to the heart of the, of this particular chapter. When we get into verse 16, and, and let me just say this about, about these next three chapters of Romans chapter one or, or these next three chapters of the beginning of Romans is that in, in up until verse 21 he's really describing the fact that mankind is guilty right humanity separate from God is guilty of an offense against God mankind born of Adam it, it, and we're going to, and he'll get into this whenever we really get into Romans chapter five. Well, really even before that, but he really begins to break it down in Romans five, why it is that way. He, he, he really brings the point home in Romans chapter six. And, and, and he keeps on talking about it in seven and eight, that mankind born of Adam is born separate from God, born with a sinful nature and has a desire to go towards sinful activity and that that this is the whole reason that the world needs Jesus and this is the whole reason and it's important for you to understand that you and I need Jesus each and every day because see our flesh is it, even though our flesh is supposed to be crucified in Christ our flesh wants to live amen it wants to live and and our old man has a, according to the scripture if we if if we are truly born again, our old man has died in Christ and a new man has been resurrected. But the enemy wants to, I used to say this a lot, wants to do CPR on our old man and cause him to come back alive. Right. And many times, you know, um, we'll, we'll think, well, you know, I don't do the things that I used to do. But sometimes our attitude still really isn't good. Right. And, and, the, and sometimes the. The motives of our heart, you know, because not sometimes we show symptoms. We'll say certain things that lead others to understand what we're thinking and what's going on. Right. But sometimes we may be. Because the scripture does say out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth yes, speaks. Yes. So sometimes whenever people speak, we can realize what was really in their heart. But some people are pretty good at hiding all that stuff. But you can't hide it from the Lord. The Lord knows, amen, that he, and he sees the things that are in our heart. But good news, I want you to know the gospel of Jesus Christ will also liberate us and set us free from those things that are deeply entrenched in our heart. I want you to know that the scripture teaches that the Lord will do a work deep on the inside of us and he will transform our hearts. Amen. So he says, so, we're, so what I was trying to say is this, is that in these first three chapters, he's going to prove that all man outside of Christ is guilty. In this first chapter, he focuses a lot on the pagan world or the heathen world, right? Those people that didn't know God that weren't Jews, by, by birth, right? In chapters two and three, he really starts to transition into the Jewish people, those that would have been religious, those that would have been ha that would have had access to the word of God and would have understood the things of God. But that can still hold true for people today who have who have had access to the word of God and and instead of operating in a a relationship with Christ where self is being crucified 
and where the new man is being fashioned and formed, that where Jesus is being fashioned, where the image of Jesus is being fashioned and formed, instead living a, a life of, of a religion. Right. Going through the motions. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Have you ever, I mean, you don't have to shake your, shake your head. Yes. Or raise your hand, but, but there's a lot of believers and I know that I have been in that mode on more than one occasion in my own life. I'm not proud of it, but if we're transparent and honest, God can work with hearts that are willing to be transparent and honest. And so if we're not careful, we can fall into the trap of religion. So in this first chapter, he's talking to people that really did not know the God of Israel, right? And then in the next two chapters, he's going to transition into religion and he's going to bring a, co a co comparison and contrast between the two. And then ultimately, the reason that I'm bringing some of this up is because we're about to hit the word righteousness. And really, that's a main theme in the whole book. And I want you to know that, that righteousness is a main theme in the book of Romans. And I need you to understand this, that righteousness really is the pivot point of Christianity. It's a gift that's been given to us through Jesus. Amen. And it really is what makes the difference when we begin to understand what true righteousness is and what is afforded to us because of true righteousness. It allows grace to flow. But let me not get ahead of myself. He says, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to those to those that believe. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I just wanted to to bring out one point to you. If we, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says this, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So I want you to see in verse 18, it says that it's, I'm sorry, in verse 7, 16, that the, that the gospel of Christ is the power of God and the salvation. And in the Corinthian letter, it says that the preaching of the cross, it's to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are being saved, it is the power of God. So the gospel is the message of the cross, right? The God, and we need to understand that. And what, is, what does that really mean? Well, it means that because that mankind born of Adam, right, is born into sin, that, that God's plan was that he promised that he would send his only begotten son. He promised that all the way back going to the garden. I'm not going to take the time to go through the whole seed and the sacrifice thought. But let me just say this. He said the seed of the woman will crush your head. He told that to the serpent. And then it wasn't just going to be the seed of the woman, but the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. I said I wasn't going to do it. It goes on all the way till the word becomes flesh. And then it's the sacrifice. Sacrifice in the garden. He closed them with the skins of an animal. Sacrifice on the Passover, right? Uh, for the whole family. And then ultimately it's sacrifice in the Levitical system, but ultimately on the banks of the Jordan, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the message of the cross because God's plan, the Bible says he was a lamb that was that was slain before the foundation of the earth. God knew in advance when he created Lucifer uh, that Lucifer was going to fall. He knew in advance that when Lucifer fell and he created the earth and put Adam and Eve in there, that 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 fallen angel was going to deceive Adam and Eve before the foundation of the earth. The lamb was already slain in the mind of God. God had a plan and the plan was to send his son, Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that the message of the cross is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that there's freedom and there's liberty in that message. I need you to know that because see, it's getting rid of your flesh is getting rid of your old self that was born of Adam. And it's allowing Christ to rule and reign on the inside of you for Christ to literally live his life through the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Amen. As he, as you become a partaker of the, of the divine nature. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of of God unto salvation to everyone that believes 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And this brings us to this place where I told you we were about to get to about righteousness. It says, it says, for therein is the righteousness of God. The ESV version says, in it, in it, in what? In the gospel of Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God, right? So he says right here, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, God gives us a measure of faith to be able to believe. God draws us. Jesus, Jesus said, no man, comes unto, no man comes to me unless the Father first draw him. The Holy Spirit draws us. Amen. Don't you know that you were drawn by the Holy Spirit? If you're saved here tonight, you were drawn by the Holy Spirit to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. You heard the gospel, but it was the Lord that drew you to, to accept him. Amen. And so um, he says, uh, from faith to faith. So he gave you faith to believe. And look, you, you need the faith, you need continued faith to continue to believe as he continues to work in your life. Amen. And 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 transform your life. Now I want to I think that this is interesting. I didn't really have it in my notes, but I kind of remember this uh, you know from studying in the past. This passage of scripture is very powerful. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and also there's a passage that sounds like it in chapter 3, I believe, where, where it says for the just shall live by faith, right? The, the, the history says that Martin Luther, y'all heard it. Now, we're not talking about Martin Luther King, but we're talking about the guy that nailed the theses on the door of the church in Germany that started the Protestant Rever Reformation. The, the, the tradition holds that when he, his eyes, because he had been struggling, he had been living a life of religion. And he, and he knew something wasn't right. He was being attacked by Satan, the story goes. Like Satan would show up in his room and just ridicule him and mock him. And, 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 but one day he was reading the scriptures and his eyes lit upon that when it says um, that, the, that the just shall live by faith. And when he read it on that particular occasion, something happened in his heart. His, his life was was transformed and that was the beginning of it because after the Lord came in and did this mighty work in his life he began to read the scriptures from a whole nother a whole nother angle it was like the Holy Spirit had opened up his heart and his eyes and he was able to now see I don't know if you've ever been that way before where you're trying to read the word of God and you feel like there's spiritual blinders or spiritual cataracts on your eyes I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit will give you revelation and understanding and if and what you really need to pray to the Lord to help you to see the, the message of the gospel of, of, of the cross, that you would be able to see what Jesus has done at the cross because it's through faith in him and what he did that allows you to have access to the, to the righteousness of God. And that whenever that begins to move in your life, it, things really begin to change and your understanding of the word of God will really come alive. Amen. And I just want to encourage you with that. But, but there's one more thing to this is that John Wesley, have you ever heard of John Wesley? He was the starter of the Methodist Church, 1700s. His brother Charles wrote multiple hymns um, for the church. Amen. The, the tradition says that he was reading Luther's commentary on this passage of Scripture. And this is what he said. He said, when I got to the part about the just shall live by faith, this is his words. My heart was strangely warmed. He had already been sitting. I mean, it's a long story about their family, but there were 17 children. Mama would put a sheet over her head for 15 minutes a day. And all the kids knew that whenever mama had the sheet over her head, that, that, you know, that they went to mess with her because that was her 15 minutes of prayer time. You know, you know, I'll tell you this. I'm not ashamed that I raised my girls in the house of God. I'm not ashamed one bit that I told them that we were church going people and we bring them to church. And I, you know, I, I, I've told that story on multiple occasions to my girls. And there was a time whenever things were real dark in one of my daughter's lives. And she told us, she said, you know, dad, I remember that story. You told me about that, about his mama. And, and she said, she said, 
I've been doing that, Dad. I've been putting a sheet over my head, and I've been asking the Lord to show up. And, and I just want you to know that don't ever, don't ever give up on telling your children about Jesus, and, and don't ever feel like you did something wrong if you're trying, if you're encouraging them to know the Lord. Listen, you only have them for a short period of time, and, and they're going to have to make the decision on their own whether they're going to serve the Lord or not. And I just want to encourage you because, you know, here recently it was also said to me but some, by the same daughter, but some people don't know how to call on Jesus whenever they're in a situation that they don't know how to get out of. But I, I think I don't know how to call on Jesus, you know, and so I just want to encourage you with that. Don't don't give up on training your children to know Jesus. Right. Amen. 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 And I'm hoping that that they're that they're gonna learn about Jesus when we come to the house of the Lord. I know that they will. Amen. So so he's saying he is he, talking about righteousness right there. He said, because the gospel of Jesus uh is is within the gospel of Jesus, the righteousness of God is revealed. Amen. And I want you to know that that the definition of righteousness is important. Because Titus says this, he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So it's not you, you and I don't work acts of righteousness in order to earn favor from God. And then now all of a sudden, no, 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 it's talking about the righteousness of Jesus. There's multiple, because matter of fact, Isaiah said, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Right. Now, now, it's important that we understand that once we're redeemed by Jesus and once we've been clothed upon by his righteousness, that now God does move upon our heart to perform acts of righteousness. And now those acts of righteousness can be accepted by the Lord because we're operating from a position of righteousness. Does that make sense? In other words, we're not we're not working, we're not doing works in order to earn favor with God. We've put faith in Christ. We've been given the gift of righteousness and now from that position or that place, now we do the work of God from that position. Does that make sense? We're not working to gain righteousness. We are righteous. And so now we do works of righteousness out of thankfulness, out of gratitude, out of a heart of thanks. The Lord showed up and did a work in my heart. And now I have a desire to do the, the work of the kingdom. Amen. Does that make sense? Praise God. I hope it does. All right. So, so, so the, the problem is, is, is that he goes on to say in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so what, what, it, what the scripture is telling us is that when it says hold the truth, other translations say suppress. So, so men, <laughs> men are trying to suppress the truth of God's word, the word of righteousness, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This has been going on. This has been going on since the time of the apostle Paul. This has been going on since the, since the garden. And, and I want to get in. We're going to get into that in a moment because it's not just man by himself. Man's having help to, to suppress the truth of God's Righteousness, and there's a, and there's an effect that happens because of the fact that mankind is suppressing the truth of God's word, and what what's happening is the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. And, and you know, many of you have already heard me talk about this before, but this word wrath is not the same as the word wrath that's utilized in the Book of Revelation. The, the word that's utilized in the book of Revelation is thumos, wrath, and describes a breathing slaughter, right? Because there's coming a day when the wrath of God, there's no more, there's not going to be any more mercy. There's not going to be any more grace. The time of grace is going to run out and God's wrath and judgment is going to fall upon wicked people. Uh, but, but right now, this, this, 
type of wrath is called orge wrath, and it's used in a different way in, in, in different passages. But right here, what seems to be happening, pretty clear from the text, is that because men are suppressing the truth, God's pouring out his wrath. And what's happening is it's like a slow spiraling down of moral decay. It's kind of like the same thing that, listen, it's not the context, but I want to make this point. The context is what's happening to the world around us. But I think, but it's also important that we understand that it, it also can happen in the lives of individual believers. And it can also happen in the church. And what I'm trying to say is, is that when we suppress the truth, when we go against the truth of what we know, and we open up doors and we give the enemy opportunity, we will see also a spiraling down of morality in our own lives. And, and, and we also will see, we, we're seeing it in the church, the church world where the church is opening itself, suppressing the truth. OK, the, the church world is certainly the modern church is suppressing the truth, the truth of the real Jesus, uh, of the real God of the Bible. And as we're seeing that, we're seeing the morality of the church spiraling down. Listen, it's, I think we've all could say that we've all fallen short of the glory of God since That's we've right. been Christians. Have we, have we not? We've all failed the Lord and none of us are proud of that. Okay, but can I tell you something? There's, 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 it's one thing whenever somebody's failing the Lord and they're ashamed of it and they're hiding it. I'm not trying to tell you that that's okay. I'm trying to make a point. It's a whole other thing whenever people are bla brazen about it and they're just and they're and and they're under the impression that it's not even wrong what they're doing. That's where we are in the modern church. We're in a situation where it appears that it's not even wrong anymore to do. To do various things, okay? And so he says the wrath of God. And so this wrath, again, is it's a spiraling down. We're just seeing it's getting worse. So we're not seeing that. We're seeing it happen before our eyes. That, that, that it, wickedness is getting more rampant. It's becoming more brazen. It's becoming more out in the open. It's unashamed. Celebrate. Yeah, celebrate. Thank you. Amen. Help us, Lord. And yes, it's celebrated. And, we're, and the very thing that we, that we were told was going to happen, that they were going to call good evil and call evil good, right? It, yeah. It's here. Yep. We're seeing it. And so it's being, the, the wrath of God's being poured out against those that are suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness. And then in verse 19, it goes on to say, because that which may be known of God is manifest yes, in them, yes. for God has showed it unto them. Right. I mean, Brother Larson used to talk about a lot of this, that about conscience and creation. Yes. That that. And, and I don't know about you, but there's been many a times I'm driving down the road and, you know, I don't know. I look at the clouds and I'm like. This this place is there's something bigger here. OK, there's been times that, that and and also the conscience. We got to understand, you know, I, I, I like the way Brother Larson used to say the conscience is the copyright that God stamped. Wow. This is my creation. I put a conscience in it. Yeah. And what the scripture saying is this. Whenever somebody tells you they're an atheist and they never believe in God or they're agnostic because they're without God, I'm here to tell you right now they're not telling you the truth. That's right. That's because they, 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 it is a lie because, because they themselves have known that God is real. Now they're choosing not to believe God is yes, real. That's right. and, and they're lying to themselves because they don't want to believe God yes. is real. And they've talked themselves into it. Now, as they suppress the truth, they may actually start at some point in time to believe the very lie that they produced for themselves. But there was a time in their life that they knew in some way, shape or form that God was real because God has placed it on the inside of them yeah. to know that. But they hold it down and, and the wrath keeps pouring out and they keep spiraling down. OK, it goes on to say in verse 20 for the invisible things of him. From the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even yes, his eternal yes, yes. power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Yes. They're not going to stand before God on judgment day and, and act like, oh, but I just didn't know. No, you knew. And, and now the gospel has really reached across the world. And I mean, I don't really have time to do justice of how. But I will say this. There, 
I have had a lot of conversations with people that say that claim that they were atheists and agnostic. And I'll never forget that we would go every Christmas to Danielle's families, and she had a couple of uncles that were really, really smart. One of them was a was a, like a physicist. Okay, he worked for NASA. And 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 we, we would get engaged in conversation, and then the, uh, the other one was another uncle that was very very smart, and and I'll never I'll never forget you know they kind of tripped me up one year, but then the Lord gave me a whole year to prepare, and 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 whenever I went in and they were like, well no, but not everybody not everybody believes the way that you do, Matt, and Christians are kind of divided. I said, well there might be a lot of Christians that are divided, but the Bible has a testimony of what. The truth is, and I said, but what about the people, they, they said this, what about the people that have never heard about the Jesus you preach? I said, no, what you need to understand is that God is just. God has always had a witness in the land. And, and it's like this, that whenever a person, this was the illustration, whenever a person has been given the truth, if he takes the truth, it's like a boat and he's putting a wake out. And that wake is that wake is going and it's touching the banks and it's touching the shores. And, it, and, and as the gospel goes forward, because that person is telling the truth, it has an effect. People are given the opportunity to hear. But but mankind chooses in his rebellion and his rebellious heart not to speak the truth. God told Adam what the truth was. Adam told his boys, Cain rejected the truth. Abel believed the truth. Abel's lineage held on to the truth of God's, God's truth and began to tell the truth. Cain's people did not hold on to the truth. And I said, and sir, I'm not trying to pick a fight, but you had the opportunity to hear the truth. Your brother got saved. Hallelujah. Your sister got saved and you rejected the truth and now your children maybe would reject the truth and then now maybe people that they would have heard would reject the truth and that's what ends up happening man suppresses the truth don't blame it on God no, we can't. They're not going to blame it on God when they stand before Him because, see, God's already planted it on the inside yes. of them and they went against yes. His will and they chose to live for themselves instead. So it goes on to say in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They became, the word vain means empty and imaginations means thinking. They became empty in their thinking. God becomes removed from their thoughts. You know, and it says, it says, and they weren't thankful. You know, I want I wanted to say something to you. Being thankful is very important as a believer. And I'm realizing that more and more in my walk with God, right? I mean, to be thankful and to have a heart of gratitude and to tell the Lord that you're thankful right. for what he's done. Even something as simple, because really the word thankful, I thought this was interesting. This was something new I learned. The word is Eucharistio. It's where I guess the word Eucharist comes from. But it even describes the idea of giving thanks before a meal. You know, and sometimes people, they don't give thanks to God because they don't acknowledge God in every aspect of their life. You know, I, I, th this may be a little too long of an illustration, but I was thinking of how, you know, some man that owns a big ranch that, you know, nowadays it probably wouldn't go this way. But let's just say back in the day, he would have butchered his own his own head of cattle. He would have produced the meat. He would have had grain, you know, and he would have harvested the grain and ground it up into flour, gave that to his wife. She ran out there to the yard, grabbed a couple of eggs from the hen and, and made some dough and made, made a piece of bread. And then he cooked a piece of meat and he sits down and he's like, my hands have made this. I fed this cow. My wife needed this dough, you know, but the man that understands God, even though that he did all that work, even though that he had to raise that cow, even though he had to butcher that cow and cook that piece of meat, he gives thanks unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you for the rain. Thank you for the, thank you for the crop. Thank you that you blessed me. Thank you for this, Lord. You, you have blessed my hands. I acknowledge you. I give you thanks, Lord. I didn't do this on my own. Amen. That's the difference in the mindset. And if we're not careful, we get puffed up and prideful and we'll start taking recognition right. for what but 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 look, people that are out there, they're 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 not thankful and they become vain in their imagination. Look, look at this. Professing themselves to be wise, they actually became fools. And really, this is where I kind of wanted to get, and I'm already running out of time, so I'm gonna have to hurry up with this. 
But look at this in verse 23. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Two words there. They changed the glory of God. Two words, glory and image. You know, they're, they're trying to not give God the glory that is due him. And they have help. And I'm not gonna, I don't have time to get into it, but Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 talk about the, the angel before he was fallen and how he was created perfect in all of his ways. But he said, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will elevate myself above these stars. I will be like the most high God. Okay, and that was before the earth was created, before man was created. The spirit of rebellion was ejected out of heaven. And then now he has been able to put this into mankind. And mankind is doing the same thing. He's not wanting to give God his glory. He's here to steal God's glory. And man even wants the glory for himself instead of giving it to God. And, and but did it, but you know, John, whenever John preached on that Wednesday night a little while back, you know, the way, I don't remember exactly how he described it, but it unlocked something for me. It, I mean, it was, a, it, it unlocked something in my mind about this passage where it says, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like to corruptible man, to, to birds, to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. And now I could take you to a bunch of different passages in Ezekiel 8 where it talks about creeping things and four-footed beasts and they were worshiping them. Because see, that's what the pagans did. And then there were, Baal was a cow. Apis was an Egyptian cow. Egypt worshiped the cow. The Canaanites worshiped the cow. And, you know, we were talking about this yesterday that mankind makes gods according to his liking. Well, if it's a, if, if I'm filled with back in the ancient days, they were filled with lust. They wanted to have wine and revelry. Let, let's worship Bacchus. They wanted to have lust. Let's or whatever they want to call it. Let's worship Aphrodite. Whatever man in his heart wants, he makes a god in the image that he wants it to be. They want some fertility. They want some rain. Let's worship Baal because the Canaanites believe that Baal had control of the rain. So whatever people want or they feel like they need, they create God in that image and likeness. And I'm here to tell you that we are full throttle in that today. I believe that. In the world that we're living in, people are trying to create a God that's in an image and likeness that they can tolerate. A God that they're willing to worship. But he's different than the God of the Bible. Yes. Because the God of the Bible is holy and he's righteous and he's true. Amen. And he said, do you be holy because I am holy. Amen. And he makes us holy because of his son. And at the same time, he puts his spirit on the inside of us. And the spirit of God is the Holy yes, Spirit. Yes. And the Holy Spirit desires to do a work in our lives. Amen. And that our life would be a reflection yes. of his goodness and his holiness. Yes. And, his, and his righteousness. We've been clothed in his righteousness. And, and, and we're seeing the, the world and the church creating an image of God that is not conduced or consistent with the word of God. That's right. And that's what we're seeing. And they, and they make this God out of their, the lust of their own heart. And because of this, in verse 26, it says, because they've done this, they profess themselves to be wise. <clears throat> And, they, and they, they, they made God in their own image that they could tolerate or that they had a desire for. Because of this, God gave them up to vile affections. Yes. It, it, God allowed this to happen. Yes, and yes. I, I don't really have time to get into it, but in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you need to understand something. There's coming a day whenever the man of sin is going to be revealed. And, it's, and the Bible says that he is going to perform miracles and then it's going to bring deception. And, you, and, we, and, and, it's, and it says that God allowed it to happen. And you wonder why. And he explains it. Because they refused to believe the truth. Yes. Because they did not want to believe the truth. He sends them strong delusion that they would believe a lie. 
And this is exactly what's going up, that they profess themselves to be wise. They made a God in it, God in an image according to their likeness. And because of this, God darkened their heart. He began to give them a reprobate mind to where they couldn't, they couldn't even see what was really happening. Their heart was becoming hard before them. Listen, sin will harden your heart. It will deceive you. You will literally think that you're okay when then obviously you're not according to the word of God. And, and, and our heart and their, and their hearts become hardened and, and that it just gets, it gets worse. It just, and it says it, it says he gave them up to vile affections. Their women didn't, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or which was due to them. They were getting repaid for what, what, they, what, they, what they did. They, they worked it and God gave them a payment for it. And, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them over yes. to a reprobate mind. It's a castaway. It's re, it's a rejected it's a rejected mind. It's unapproved to do those things which are not convenient, things that are not good, things that are against God. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. Wicked. Look at this. Now, he, now look at verse twenty nine. I don't. I know we're getting long here. Just bear with me, just a little bit longer, because look, he's talking about homosexuality, but don't get lost in that, because look what he's talking about now. He, he mentions other things: fornication, wickedness, covetousness. That's a desire to have something that belongs to somebody else. Maliciousness. That, that means that means like really backbiting. Yes. Full of envy. Okay, a, a murder spirit. Like, you know, when you're full of envy, that means somebody has something you want when they got it, and you're jealous because they got it, and you don't have it. And listen, church, Christian, if that's in your heart, we're supposed to recognize that, and we're supposed to ask the Lord to deal with that. Amen? Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, goes on to that backbite stuff. Next verse. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, and bitters of evil things. Look at this. Disobedient to parents. Lord, help us. And I mean, listen, teenagers have always struggled with rebellion. The Lord knows that Pastor Matt was one of them. But I mean, our poor children, man, we need to pray for our kids, for our young people and for, for teenagers. The spirit of rebellion is really out there and it's really it's, it's having its way in these young people's Young people's lives. Verse 31. Without understanding. Covenant breakers. Without natural affection. Implacable. Unmerciful. Yeah, that word implacable is kind of similar to covenant breakers. How, how do you feel whenever you make a deal with somebody? I mean, and then it doesn't go your way. Do you just break it off? I mean, it's, I mean yeah, covenant breaker with God. But, but also, I mean, I dude, I've been seeing how people do business sometimes. It's like something doesn't go their way. And you're like, well, I'm done. I'm out of this. Yes. You know, or even in relationships. Like, no, this ain't working out for me. I'm, I'm moving on. Come on. That's not, the, that's not the will of God, man. That's, our hearts are hard. You know, well, a great earthly example is marriage. Yeah. And Jesus said it. Jesus told those Pharisees, he said, can we put her away for anything, for any reason? That's what the Pharisees wanted to know. Can we put her away? We just want to put her away for any cause. And Jesus is like, well, this is, the, this is why you can. And he's like, yeah, but Moses told us we could write her a letter of divorce. And Jesus said, because, it's the, because of the hardness of your heart. That's right. It's the hardness of your heart. And, and sometimes that's what happens. Our heart gets hard. And, and, and we don't want our heart to be hard. Amen? We want our heart to be soft. Right. Towards the Lord. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 32. Singers, musicians, why don't y'all come up here and sing us a song as we as we close out tonight. We're gonna read this last verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, but not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know, I don't know really, I don't pay attention to who watches these videos. <laughs> But let me just say this, if by some chance somebody's watching tonight 
I'm here to tell you right now, if you have family members, listen, I'm not telling you don't love your family members if they're living a, a lifestyle, like a sexual lifestyle, like I was talking about here. I'm not telling you don't love them. I'm not telling you that you don't ever talk to them. I'm not telling you don't tell them that you don't love them. I'm not telling you don't pray for them, but I'm telling you right now, you better not have pleasure in what they're doing and you better yes. not be a partaker of what they're doing right. because the word of God is clear that those that commit such things are worthy of death, but not only them, those that have pleasure and those that do them. That's the word of the Lord. That's not, that's not pastor Matt saying that that's the Bible and that's the new Testament. And, and, and I just want to encourage people Listen, you have to be able to, we have, if we're believers, we have to be able to take a stand for the truth of what God's word says. Father, we just give you glory and honor tonight. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in every heart and in every life. Lord, you see those people that are out there. Maybe they have family members, Lord, and, and that their family members are caught up in these. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, I stand in agreement with them. And I pray that you would move by the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you put a, 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 a prayer warrior as desire for intercession on the inside of these parents and family members. That they begin to cry out, oh Lord God, for their loved ones. Lord, I cry out for my loved ones, oh Lord God. I pray that you'd move, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. That you'd begin to awaken them, Lord God. Lord God, that you'd cause light to flood their mind, oh Lord. That you bring conviction, Lord God, and that you draw them home. We just give you glory and honor tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship Him.